um, excited to see some familiar faces. Um, I want to do just a kind of quick introduction of, of who I am and, and why I'm here. Um, and hopefully we can make this as interactive as possible. Um, I've got a, a slide deck that I'll go through um, with a couple games that we'll play, but it's kind of quick games just to, sh it's a show not tell type of methodology that I have. Um, but so I um, come from a family foundation background. Um, I have seen the other side of grant making and fundraising um, as a funder for a lot of my life. And what I have been really passionate about for a number of years is trying to make that process more accessible, giving people access to being on the other side of the equation and seeing what that process is like. Because I think if you see it from both sides as people that are looking for grants and fundraising and talking to donors, kind of knowing how the other side operates can be really helpful in structuring out um, you know, how, how you might approach them and build those relationships. Um, and so a lot of the work that I've been doing in the last number of years um, has been to generate a bunch of different ways that people can get involved. And so Game Genius is um, one of those mechanisms. Um, there's a giving circle that I've helped launch in the area. And there are a couple boards that I sit on that are trying to make philanthropy more accessible and help people fundraise and think about ways to build those relationships. So with that kind of as a backdrop, um, what I'd love people to do is to type in the chat um, they're just their name, organization, and then biggest pain point in the fundraising process. I'd love to just kind of get a collection of pain points that we might be able to address as we go through this. And there's going to be a Q&A at the end, so um, I might be able to address them more one-on-one -on -one there as well. So give you a second to type in the chat, name, organization, biggest pain point in the fundraising process and I'll read some out as they come in. So increasing individual donor base, yes. Tracking the holistic nature of our relationship with the donor, yes. Uh, getting board members to be willing to acknowledge and participate in fundraising, yes. Leveraging all your people in the room. Donor base, board involvement, yes. Donor data to understand those relationships and build on them, yeah. Yeah, these are great. So feel free to keep them coming. Um, I'll, I'll check back in on this um, a little bit later, but hopefully as you as you look through these, there's kind of a not aloneism that you'll feel uh, as you'll look through. I think there are some themes that come in in fundraising that need to be addressed at the funder level. And so a lot of um, my work uh, kind of away from Game Genius is, or, using Game Genius as a mechanism to try to bring it back to funding spaces and say, hey, these are some pain points that I'm hearing. How can we do better um, as funders? And so hopefully that's the kind of conversation we can open up. And I think philanthropy is getting uh, a lot more like that, you know, thanks help to, to groups like the Catalog for Philanthropy. So really excited to be here and, and thanks for taking an hour, hour out of your day. Um, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. So we're here um, to talk about fundraising and donor stewardship. Um, for those of you who do not know Game Genius, um, it's a 501c3 pending. We just applied for 501c3 status um, in early March. So we're excited to, to join you all in this journey um, that provides play-based services and experiences to support leaders, organization, and socially beneficial initiatives in the greater Washington, D.C. area. So in short, we really like play and games, and we think it's a powerful way to help people grow. Um, and so there are a bunch of different ways that we do that. Oh. Um, we have kind of a three part approach. And so what I wanna do today is show a couple different case studies of how you can use play in games, how we've used play in games already um, in some of our work. Um, and so we'll spotlight a couple events um, and things that we've done in the past. Um, so our three arms at Game Genius are we think about services, how we can empower and build capacity in uh, nonprofits. So a lot of times we see nonprofits and, and organizations that are trying to fundraise um, not necessarily have the bandwidth to do something risky or different or new. And so we're hoping that um, by just providing some of that creative capacity, we'll have the 
um, we'll have we'll start to build those relationships and interconnectivity between organizations and um, you know people can work together a little bit better. So we have a service side. Um, we'll talk about um, like a treasure hunt that we helped uh, an organization with um, called Phoenix Bikes in Arlington. Um, we work on products. We think about games themselves as donor um, awareness and appreciation tools. So think about how you might be able to use a game to showcase your mission in a way that's hands-on um, and how you might be able to use that in different functions, whether that's at a public event or as a way to say thank you. Um, there are a lot of different ways that games can be used in that way. And then finally, we have a sort of experience branch, which is um, we like to try to show, not tell a lot of this ourselves. And so as an organization that's becoming a nonprofit shortly, um, we like to think about having these shared social moments and celebratory events. You know, a lot of, uh, of you, I'm sure, have some kind of gala or golf tournament or some kind of big event every year that you kind of put a lot of energy into. And our whole, our whole methodology is how can you align that experience with the mission itself? So making it not just an event that makes money, but an event that showcases what you're all about. And that's something that I think can really help in the storytelling aspect of fundraising and continuing uh, communication or relationship with a donor. So those are some of the three pieces we'll dive into. Um, as we think through a lot of our early engagement process with, with fundraising, we have these sort of six guiding questions. And if you take nothing else away from today, um, this, is, this is the slide that I think can be most helpful. It's nothing really new, but it's just sort of taking the lens of your kind of why, what, who, how, when, where approach of what, uh, what is your fundraising about and trying to align both your goal and the funder's goal. And if those things are more aligned, it's gonna be much easier. There's gonna be a lot less friction in the process. And so that's when I was saying at the beginning, knowing sort of how a funder works and what they're looking to do is most of the, most of the battle in terms of finding fundraising and stewarding some of those donors along. Um, because as we've seen kind of on, on our family foundation side, there might be a very quick switch with a priority that we wanna focus on. And we're not very good at communicating that to the community and nonprofit would have no idea. And all of a sudden you fall off the map because you're no longer within that priority. And so that clear communication is, is critical on both sides. Um, and so we'll walk through this um, really quickly um, but hopefully this is fairly intuitive. What we like to think about is this, these six questions in two halves. So sort of your purple half and your blue half, so left and right, um, because the left is really about what you can do now. So thinking about why are you doing this fundraising activity? What are you building? Uh, and who is going to be a part of, of that experience, both on your team and the people in the community that can help or your board members um, or you know, various supporters. And so thinking about how you can define that up front to get you going is going to be really, really critical to thinking about more on the right side, which is kind of culture heavy. So the hows, thinking about like who you have on your team, their strengths, what they really enjoy doing. Um, the sort of where's and when's of how you're going to execute those things are when you have a, a product or an idea in place. Um, those are questions that are a little bit easier to answer and structure around. And so we like to think of it in sort of two halves when we're fundraising. Um, and, and hopefully these things dovetail. And so as you see through some of the examples, hopefully these, these themes start to pop out. Our goal as a nonprofit is to share as many resources as we can. And so we're building um, up our website. Uh, hopefully soon we'll have a page that looks similar to this um, that shares um, different resources in each one of these six categories to help you through um, if you need help thinking about a what or you know what are you trying to build, a creative type of fundraiser. We have a bunch of um, different um, activities, games, uh, questions that you can help kind of work yourself through. Um, again, this is all about sort of empowering you as a funder or fundee um, to, to, to reach out and, and, and create a really dynamic experience for, for your, your donors. Um, so 
I'm going to move next slide. So just a kind of raise of hands, how many people have used the annotate feature in Zoom? I see some hands. I see some claps, that's good. Okay, so for those of you who have not used the annotate feature in Zoom, um, you should be able to go up to the top of your screen if everyone wants to do that now. Um, and you'll find a button that says view options, you might have triple dots, you might see something with a pen icon, but if you go into a view options menu, you'll see something that says annotate. That will allow you to draw on the screen. Um, you'll get a little panel that pops up. Uh, it gives you stickers. Some people have found stickers. Uh, there's a pen. There's um, some shapes that I think are, are pre-created pre, uh, for you. And so you can type, yep, perfect. So some people are finding them. Good, uh, give it a couple more seconds. Um, if anybody's having trouble, um, feel free to, to type in the chat um, if you can't find it. We find that interacting in a virtual platform is one of the newest challenges that we've had to deal with in kind of the fundraising space. Um, obviously getting together in person has been much harder uh, in the last year or so. Um, and so we've been trying to find really accessible ways for people to play and enjoy themselves on Zoom or a virtual meeting platform. Uh, we found Zoom to be really effective because of this annotate tool. There's actually a whiteboard that kind of automates this whole thing. Um, there are breakout rooms that you can create specific experiences for people and keep it more intimate. Um, there are a lot of strategies that we found to be more successful in this virtual platform and happy to answer some of those questions as they come up. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of names that kind of pop up here. Let me, I'm going to clear the screen. So I am going to stop share right now so I can see people's faces. Um, and so what we're looking for um, are a couple of volunteers. We're going to play quick game. Um, but hopefully this can get people into uh, uh, sort of appreciation for how important communication is when you have this big idea and you want to share it with a donor, um, how different strategies of communication can really change an outcome. And so for people who have played Pictionary, there's usually a drawer and there's someone who's trying to communicate uh, what that drawing is, we've got a, a game like that. So we need a volunteer to be a communicator. So we'll call them the visionary. And we've got, we need about two or three people to be, uh, to draw what the visionary is telling them. So for the visionary, I'm going to give you a picture and you're going to have to explain that picture. So I need a volunteer to be that visionary and I need a couple volunteers to be drawers. I'll play. All right, I see Jessica and Jackie. Do you want to be which which role do you would you like to be? Happy for whatever. Jackie, you be the visionary. Sounds good. Okay, so Jackie, visionary, Jessica, you'll be one of the drawers. Do we have any other people want to draw? I'll draw. I missed it. Who is that? I'm looking That's for names. Oh, Adelaide. Uh, my wife's name is Mary Adelaide, so I love the name. Oh, that's um, okay, so this is great. This is good for a first team. Uh, Jackie, I am finding you in the chat. And I'm going to give you a specific message. You get that? Yeah. Okay, so open up that link. That's the picture that you need to describe to your team. And we'll, we'll jump back into the, the screen share here in a second so that they can open up their drawing tools. And Adelaide and Jessica, um, you'll be trying to draw what Jackie is telling you. You'll have two minutes. Um, it's a fast paced game uh, and I guess before we start, do you have any strategies that, you know, Jessica and Adelaide, that you'd like to talk about? I'll give you like a minute to talk about some strategies of how you might draw, given that 
you're not in the same room together. So we're drawing one picture together. You're drawing one picture together. So how might you do this uh, as effectively as possible? Or what can you communicate to Jackie that would help you in this two minutes? Are they allowed to talk while yes. they're doing it? OK. Yes. Hmm. I mean, I think we should try and do more than one type of drawing. So something that's a little more literal and then something that's a little more conceptual. So like, you know, if it was makeup, like a girl applying makeup and then like May and cup, you know, kind of things. I don't know. Peter, are there rules for what I am and am not allowed to say? There are not. We're not playing wow. kind of a taboo style game where there are things you cannot say. So you can fully explain the picture, which I recognize is difficult if you couldn't. Uh, <laughs> so there are no rules against what you can say. Anybody can talk. Um, and I'm going to jump back into the screen share here. And let me. Okay. So uh, if you're ready, um, I'm going to start the timer. The timer is in the bottom left corner. Uh, if you, if, if Adelaide and Jessica, if you both get your drawing, uh annotate panels open um we'll start the timer when you're ready so just tell me when you are I, i'm ready i'm, a, I I'm ready i mean if if you're a better drawer jessica i can do the simple <laughs> i'm not a good artist so um yeah i think we we signed up <laughs> to that artist so <laughs> we'll be okay all right uh when you're ready timer starts now all right, so it's like a big balloon like you see at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade of a pig with sunglasses on and little wings at the top of its head. Um, so the body of the pig is a very big pink circle. And then it has um, a pretty big round nose with two black circles right under the nose. It's a really cheesy toothy smile. Um, and you can see three of the four legs of the balloon. See what we got. Okay, yeah, there we go. So that's a good size nose. The body's a lot bigger. Oh. So the majority of the pig is just a big circle for the body. And then it has little tiny legs, like one of the oversized exact, yes, like that, like an oversized exaggerated balloon. And then there's lots of people underneath of it as well. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, you guys are doing great. Is there a way to get rid of that, the long pig? Yes. <laughs> okay, perfect. And then we just need the sunglasses, the nose. Horrible. Oh, no, that works. And then <laughs> little wings at the very top too. Beautiful. All right. Good work. <laughs> I gave it a crown. <laughs> and you give it a crown. Um, awesome. Well, so as you can imagine, two minutes, not a lot of time. This picture and the clunkiness of the tool on Zoom is not the easiest thing to draw with. You're probably taking a mouse and you know it's not like you have a pen that you can draw with. Um, and so thinking about the tools that you have at your disposal, um, is is important to recognize as you know in both the communication aspect of things, but also you know how people are envisioning what you're telling them. The level of detail that you're giving at specific times um, can really change how people interact with a fundraising campaign. Um, how you might 
uh, connect with a donor from time to time. And so this is just, again, it's a silly exercise, but it gets you thinking about like, well, what could I have done better to explain this pig? Um, what could I have done better to get to the real uh, ideas? And so hopefully you're starting to think of like, okay, if I had another shot at this, like what would I have done? Um, so I'd love to hear from people if you wanna type in the chat of ways that um, you might be thinking about, all right, I, this is what I, I think I would do if I had two minutes, this would be my strategy. If you wanna type in some like key pointers that you think were, were good. Um, some of these things will overlap in how you communicate with, with, uh, with a group. But in general, our goal is to use these types of games and kind of weave in some of the takeaways to just get people having fun and enjoying the fundraising process. There's, uh, I'm sure that's not a sentence that's said a lot, um, you know, in terms of reaching out to donors and building those relationships, that could be really enjoyable. But a lot of the time, there's still a lot of stress that comes with fundraising because either there's a certain amount of money you need to raise in order to keep doing the work you're doing, um, or you're creating these relationships that hinge upon, um, you know, some certain events that that happen. Um, and so it, it creates some 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 tension, I think, in the fundraising community. There's a lot of competition between nonprofits and trying to get grants. And so that naturally creates a lot of siloing. And so hopefully playing together can, can create this open, more collaborative sense of fundraising, which we feel like is, is kind of that next generation of, of fundraising. We're seeing a lot of younger donors trying to find how to group their dollars. So you see this through giving circles um, ways that they can get involved and give bigger, more impactful gifts. Um, we're seeing um, individuals try to figure out where nonprofits are collaborating and working together so that they can get almost maximize a project because you've got the expertise coming from multiple organizations. And so thinking about how you might be able to collaborate to tell that bigger story and not try to spread yourself so thin um, that it feels like you're always behind the eight ball as you're, as you're, as you're fundraising. And so if any of that resonates, um, a lot of times play can help just sort of reframe some of that conversation and bring other people into the room. Um, so I know everyone is probably dying to see what this pig looks like. Uh, so behind the curtain, the blue curtain, um, is the picture of the pig. Uh, so that is what Jackie saw. Um, I think you nailed it. Uh, should be in a museum. Um, and uh, excellent work. So we'll move, we'll move forward. Um, okay, so I mentioned a couple case studies that, that we did. This is the first one. Um, we worked with a group called Phoenix Bikes, which is in Arlington. Um, as the name might suggest, they, they use bikes and, and kind of a make a bike, build a bike, um, riding bikes as a program to help both kind of workforce development. Uh, they use some educational things as well. Uh, wonderful organization. We thought that um, what they did was really great. They came to us uh, last year to think about ways that they could just add a little bit more creativity to some of their bike rides around Arlington. And so what we essentially served here was just a, it was a capacity building, empowering them to take some of the parts that were less fun or they had less expertise in, which in this case was designing a web platform that they could uh, have a scavenger hunt or treasure hunt built into. And so we helped them build a website um, that players could type in answers when they went from place to place around uh, the city of Arlington on the bike ride. And they could learn about some of these really cool spots. And so the story that they were trying to tell here was both, here's something that is really integral to our lifestyle, our programming, which is riding bikes and understanding what that does for, for empowering people. Um, but they could tell that story through a journey, an actual physical journey, which to them was a great way for them to engage their donors, their individual donors, um, the people that support them. Um, and so this was kind of a, it was an active, uh, fundraiser of sorts. And they got a lot of people to come out because they saw just sort of a different approach to a bike ride. It was, you know, a scavenger hunt plus bike ride, which felt like a novel event. And so it was memorable enough that it got more people than they were expecting out into the community. And now they remember that event and want more. 
And that's the kind of thing that can generate a lot of really good momentum in fundraising. And so this is some of the stuff that we love to do. And so um, we always put this out here. We love, we love talking with a catalog for philanthropy. Every, every organization that's within it, we're more than happy to, to help brainstorm and think through ideas if you would like another mind or voice in the room. Um, and, and hopefully we can, we can help you out in, in any way. So that, that offer is always on the table. That's kind of what Game Genius is all about um, in, in the community. Um, moving to the next one, next case study is a product. So as a game company, obviously we're in a advantageous scenario because we create games anyway. So us stewarding our donors um, we create a lot of games, but what we want to try to do is showcase games that can help people have hard conversations. And so one of our first games that we built to help share with our sort of as a thank you gift to both donors, but also clients that we worked with, um, was a game called Consensus. It was a way for really anyone to have a tough conversation and to prioritize what they should be working on. Um, and so we worked with entrepreneurs, we worked with um, organizations, we worked with a, a lot of different types of students um, and trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to prioritize what to work on? And we really love using this game in a fundraising capacity, thinking about who our model group that we're, we're targeting is. And so I saw in some of the, the initial chats about biggest pain point, of individual donors, you know, how do we engage individual donors more? Um, some groups are thinking about more on the institutional side. We want to go after family foundations or community foundations and some of these bigger institutions that are, um, you know, harder to get in front of because they're more competitive or they're more private. Um, you know, the strategies of those things are very different. Uh, and so understanding who you have on your team, what connections you have, or what connections you need to be able to execute those strategies, this game just kind of helps people start those conversations. And so um, as a second interactive exercise, and I know we've got a bunch of people in the room, and so I think in response to that, we're just going to sort of call out, maybe we'll do a, a quick chat uh, on kind of what people feel. But so we've got four four debates sort of on the screen right now. Um, the way that this game typically works is it's sort of like tug of war, um, where you have a certain number of moves and you're trying to move this little die with the two arrows on the side of it, both directions. And your goal is to get it into one of the symbols on the board that represents your position in the debate. So it's kind of like a a tug of war game, you're usually given a predetermined card that matches those symbols. And so you can practice kind of like how you might negotiate with a group when there are a lot of different games happening at the same time. Um, but in, in real use, we use this as a way to indicate the opinions in a room so that people can see a wide array of what people are feeling as, as like your best campaign strategy. So in this case, you'll see four debates. They're kind of on the rows. So if we were thinking about a campaign as a group right now, um, you can kind of think about it in your own, in your own organizational, from your own organizational lens. So um, if you think that what you need is more individual funders, um, you might be leaning more on the sort of the left of the green spectrum on the bottom. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to type a number from one to nine. One is representing the farthest left side of a board and nine is the farthest right. So five is the middle point. There are nine symbols if you see them on the board here. Um, and so what I want you to do is I want people to type in the chat um, what, where they believe they could use their, the best use of their time is on the top spectrum. So from one to nine, one being big grant, one big grant that we wanna go after, nine being a bunch of small grants. What's your strategy um, for say the upcoming fiscal year um, or a campaign that you're, you're trying to launch? And I'm gonna stop sharing. Actually, I'm gonna try to get in the chat here. All right, I see it. Okay, so I see a bunch of numbers. I'm seeing kind of a three, four-ish on average. So hopefully I see a one. 
Uh, I love that. Yeah, so I'm seeing something kind of in that three, four range. So recognizing that um, I'm sure time is a factor in that conversation. Uh, if we were to open this up um, to the larger group, uh, you know, why, why bigger grant versus smaller grants? Um, if you want to type in the chat, just like quick reasons of why you might cost benefit analysis. Yep. Uh, less grant reporting. Yes, we're going to get to that in a second. Uh, yeah, there, there are a couple things that I could think about in terms of, you know, why you might go after one big grant versus many small grants. Um, outreach and exposure. Yep. Kind of making that the one or one bigger grant probably has a bigger name attached to it, or at least they're going to have a little bit more buy-in to the project. Uh, time commitment, hedging against not being able to get big grant in future years. Yes. The relationship management. Yeah. Staff capacity. Yep. Yeah. These are all great. Um, there's also a huge pressure around one grant, right? So choosing literally one grant to go after, you go after the MacArthur Prize or something and you get, what is it, the million, $100 million or something now that they're giving out. Um, you know, you go after those types of grants, super, super competitive. The chance of getting it is like winning the lottery at this point. Um, and if you don't get it, that puts you in a really tough spot. And so that's what we see a lot of the time are, are people thinking about the time cost benefit analysis, a lot of these great points that you've written, um, but hopefully visualizing this and seeing that everyone is in a slightly different position, but there's there are a lot of similarities in what people are saying. Ways to tease out um, how you might strategize around whether you're a two and a three, like to some people twos and threes might be the same, um, but are you going after this type of grant? Uh, so if, as we go down this as this list, we'll do this a couple more times. Um, if you think about what you're fundraising for, your general operating, so your uh, funds that can go to anything in your organization is a one versus a specific project, which is a nine, uh, where would you fall on that spectrum in your campaign? <laughs> I get the sense that there might be a lot of the same answer here. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot, a lot of low numbers. And someone in the middle, good, yes. I see a nine, awesome. Yes, what we find about this category is it's super polarized. Um, so Michael, I love the fact that you're in the middle because it's a very rare thing when we, when we play this game. Um, but I think it's important to recognize that there are pros and cons to both, right? There, for, from a funder's lens, funding a specific project gives us a really easy story to bring back to, to our foundation. We can get inside the ropes and really enjoy the fact that that impact, we're seeing the impact because we can see a specific project. But on the other hand, general operating, way more flexible. This is probably nothing new to to any of you here on the call, but really having this open conversation with a funder can be really helpful. Um, and there are more and more funders out there that are willing to have the conversation of like, well, is general operating something that's really critical right now for you to move the ball forward? Or can we donate to a specific project because that will give us a better chance of funding it year after year. And just knowing those conversations are on the table um, I think will will really help um, will really help those relationships grow. Um, I know there's a there's a big there's sort of a toxic dynamic between funders and fundees a lot of the time because there's a lot of power with people that have sort of the dollars that they're giving out. I'm optimistic that that's changing, um, and I think one of the reasons it's changing is because people are more transparent, people are more willing to have these conversations. And so I don't think it hurts to reach out, but at the very least you can use sort of play or these sort of lighter spaces to sort of open those conversations, to share with people, you know, that general operating might be really, really important for us or a specific project is really on the top of our mind. And this is absolutely what we need funding for. And if this will help you advocate with, with your group or your board member 
can take this and run with it better, um, that's something that uh, will be really helpful to talk through. Um, so we'll, we'll do one more of these. Um, let's do let's do individual funders versus institutional funders. Um, I think I got a couple of these comments at the beginning, um, but curious to know if if are people going after your one of individual funders um, or your bigger institutions? So think government, think uh, larger schools, institutions um, that are that are going to give you some dollars. It's a little bit more variable here. Yeah, something kind of in the middle that sees kind of the average that I'm seeing. Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks. For, these are great responses. And so, again, hopefully just sort of seeing each other and sort of seeing how we might be in different spaces looking for different things. I know there are a lot of different organizations represented here at different scales. Um, but this one typically is a, a balance. And I think when you start to layer individual fundraising, institutional fundraising with some of these other categories on this list, it starts to create a constellation of a strategy of what you're trying to do. Um, if you're going after one big grant and an individual funder, you might be really narrowing your pool, right? You're trying to find that, you know, the billionaire. Uh, that's willing to give to your to your cause. Um, so thinking about some of this strategy and just visualizing it. And I think this can really help at the board level of having these conversations and aligning yourselves and saying like, here's our strategy. Here's a visual for the people in the room that aren't gonna take uh, you know, auditory direction or even almost text direction. They can see it and say, oh, okay, this is why we're doing this. We've had a conversation, I can internalize it and create a strategy or a way to pitch that to my network. And for a board, um, so that is oftentimes the biggest thing that's missing is what role do they play and how, um, how can they best promote uh, what the organization needs. Um, so that's where a lot of board stewardship and, and we'll get to that uh, today and in future sessions too. Um, I'm gonna move forward uh, so one last question, I know this came up. Uh, what's your favorite way to update your supporters? Um, there are obviously a lot of things that, that can fall into this category. I think we've touched on a couple of them, um, but would love to hear in the chat, your favorite way to update supporters. Like how do we kind of steward those relationships? I see emails, maybe newsletters, mailers, emails, direct appeal, e-blasts, a lot of similarities here. Yeah, phone calls. So you get on the phone call and actually call them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I think those can be really helpful, but obviously time consuming. Uh, E-newsletters, yes. Uh, how, for, for people who have put emails, which is, which is most of you, um, do you find that do you know if whether the funder opens the email or whether they is there an action step for them to take and is there a way to measure uh, whether they've taken that action step? Um, that's you don't necessarily have to answer that in the chat, but just kind of thinking about uh, emails are great. They're pretty low capacity bandwidth. It can take a ton of time having put together enough newsletters uh, in the past. Um, but yes, tracking links. Uh, and opening rates, uh, you know, there are a lot of platforms that, that will do that and, and help you recognize who's opening the emails and who's not. Um, and that's a way that you can use technology to your advantage. Um, but I like to think of reaching out to people, again, as this sort of behavioral system of, if people are not opening your emails, why is that? Um, if people are opening your emails, great. Are they taking the steps you want them to take? And if they're not, how can you get some of that information to improve your process? And for me, this is a lot of like watching the tape. If you're, you know, played a sport growing up, uh, you might watch your opponent or watch someone that you're about to play, uh, you know, react in certain cir circumstances. It's kind of doing that due diligence um, is really helpful for at least getting those initial conversations in place and then having kind of the system behind it to follow up. Um, funders, 
you know, have a, a lot of things going on. Uh, they probably have their own careers. And so it, it reaching out more than once is, is not a headache for them. Um, but asking them, you know, how they can, how you can engage them and what makes them most excited about your mission is some really, really big topical, you know, topics of conversation that you can have. They're super simple, but very, very effective. And again, another thing that kind of play and games and fun can draw people in better than a lot of different activities. And so using those spaces as a way uh, to, to catalyze conversation. Um, so thank you for, for those. Um, kind of last case study um, that we've done is every year as an example for how games and play can, can make a difference, we try to do a two events a year. One we're launching this year in April. Um, this one has been going on for a couple years um, and it's called the district hunt. So we try to do a treasure hunt. Um, if that hasn't become abundantly clear that I really like treasure hunts, um, uh, I do, but I, it's, it's an adventure, it's a story. It kind of brings everything that a game has to offer to the table. You can create opportunities for people to choose their own adventure, to kind of engage with material at different levels. Um, so for us, we choose an impact theme every year at Game Genius. Um, two years ago, it was women's history. Uh, last year, it was um, mental health. And this year, it's climate and environment. And so what we try to do is we try to tell sort of charrette-like stories every year of here are a lot of resources that can help you engage. And we're taking a lot of that information and data that we're finding at these events, and we're trying to share it with organizations that are in these spaces. So if you find yourself in climate environment this year, uh, stay tuned, uh, because we're trying, to, we're trying to collect a lot of information about what the region is, wants to engage with. And hopefully that can be helpful information for fundraising, but also just engaging them in your programming, um, which can be a really great way to get individuals, but also to show impact. So we do a treasure hunt every year, it's in the fall. Um, our goal is to just introduce people to different parts of DC, um, highlight it from a slightly different lens. Uh, this year will be a lot of kind of green spaces and what, what that can do to help people um, you know, promote environmental causes. It's an intersectional problem. And so there are a lot of different organizations that can tie into this. And so again, this collaborative approach of trying to bring people into the same space um, hopefully can get some cross collaboration on, hey, you know, you have a donor that's really interested in X and Y. Um, how can we, how can we do a project that you know, heightens both? Uh, and so that's what, a lot of what we're trying to find. Um, I'm going to fly over this. I'll, I'll leave this chat uh, or leave this link in the chat at the end. Um, as we're building up to the event, we, we like to show case kind of some of the work that we're doing. We've created a couple online escape rooms. Um, if you're familiar with escape rooms as, as a game concept, it's usually done in person. That's hard to do when you're in a pandemic. And so we've been trying to build just some innovative ways to get people to think about issues while trying to solve a problem themselves. So using gamification, using game learning, um, the distinction of those two things is somewhat important and happy to, to dive into both. It's a longer conversation, but gamification is much more of like your badges and like incentivization. So if you think of like an app on your phone that gives you rewards for things, that's more gamification. Game learning is more using kind of behavioral characteristics of people to say, all right, we're going to create this game mechanic that teaches people about some cause or about some kind of learning takeaway. And so it's a lot more intensive and embedded and in, in, intentional in a way. Um, and I think studies are finding that gamification is very good for getting people engaged, but game learning is better for getting people to retain knowledge. So thinking about what you want to use as you implement gamification or game learning into your programming uh, is, is important when you start. Uh, there are a lot more studies coming out, a lot of people starting to use these, these approaches. And so, you know, doing simple research of, you know, how do, how do I make, how do I imply or apply gamification or game learning to X topic? That's going to become more and more relevant, I think, on Google. <laughs> um, so I think those resources will be available. 
Um, so this is an escape room that we've designed around climate and environment. We've got a couple series of these things and we'll share the link in the chat so you can see an example. Um, it's another thing that you know, we're more than happy to help think through if that's a, an exciting direction for you to engage different people in your program. Um, as I mentioned, we have a second event that we're launching in April. Um, two things of note here. Um, one is to sort of plug the next workshop, which we're doing on the 21st of April. Um, and it's all about how to engage your staff and board. Uh, similar conversations to here. There, there'll be some, some overlaps on, on kind of strategies and ways you might do that, but we'll have a couple different examples. Um, you know, feel free to invite people into that conversation because we'd love to to build it out as much as we can. And we'll do a little bit more on kind of breakout rooms and make it more uh, conversational. And then um, on the 22nd, part of this sort of play week that we're doing, it's a celebration of play and how it can be impactful. Uh, we're doing some, some uh, fundraising contests, sort of a catalog for philanthropy does this um, or every giving Tuesday. Um, or trying to create some kind of fun gamified um, mechanism around giving, get people to share um, their, their cause. Um, and so for, around the environment uh, organizations, we're creating kind of a, an Earth Day themed fundraising competition. But to think about that as a way to get individual donors and to get them to compete against their friends, the peer-to-peer -peer campaigns are really, really effective. Um, at getting people to uh, share the message organically. And I think much like talking to funders, talking to individuals and finding kind of what engages them most is really, really helpful in understanding how you might be able to improve your process or tell your message to a certain audience more effectively. Um, finally, um, I don't know if any of these, these organizations are on here. I don't think so, but some of these are catalog nonprofits. Um, some case studies that are kind of within peer groups. I, I think that everyone on this call has the creative capacity to design an amazing event. Um, I think often time and um, just the ability to, to, to kind of take a step back with all the things that are going on is, is one of the, the biggest barriers. And so that's what we're trying to help lower. Um, we, had, we, we don't have a piece in all of these events, but we've, we've connected with all of these organizations. So Story Tapestries is a, is a great organization kind of in the education space, as is A260C. They both do big events um, that are very kind of peer-to-peer. -peer. Story Tapestries was a... Um, a like a big storytelling metaphor where they kind of put together a plate of, or a, a, a menu of, of a, a run of show. And they really, really use their theater background and their kind of storytelling expertise to drive that into their event. And that really showed the amount of work that went into it was significant, but that work was also mission related. They were able to bring in people from their programs to help them. They were able to engage their board. And so thinking about fundraising and doing these big events uh, as both something that's going to make you money, but also tells your story. Uh, the number of golf tournaments I've been to uh, that don't leverage sort of any part of the story of an organization, um, is, is something that I think is a really great example of here's a fundraiser that works really well, but are you losing value because your advocates don't know what to do next? Um, and so that's that upper right picture is actually a, a tournament up where I'm from in New Hampshire. Um, there's a, a mental health organization that uses different challenges on whole. So if you're familiar with golf, they put you on like a balance board. They put you with like beer goggles so that you have to like try to hit a ball upside down. And, and so just thinking about putting people in the mindset of what is it like to have uh, some kind of um, impairment um, to do something that you're very familiar with doing makes it much harder. To give people that empathetic moment is something, again, that games can do really well, but in a little bit lighter of a context. 
Um, and so all of these are examples of ways that organizations used an event or a fundraising tool to both make more than they probably would if they ran a traditional event, but also to tell their story and give people direction on how they can spread the word. Um, and so you know, happy to answer questions on any of these kind of successful events. I know uh, I recognize a, a couple groups on the call um, that have done really, really great events as well. Uh, we've helped with some of them. Um, and, uh, and I think the biggest component of putting on an event is really thinking about the whole process, the whole system in place. And do you have all the people? That's again, that kind of the why you're doing it, the what and the who is to sort of launch the project, but then thinking about how you can sustain yourself and think about the work-life balance of this and making it fun um, is going gonna, is gonna to show through, that energy is going to show through um, to, to people that come to the event. Um, so we're kind of back to this uh, as, a, as a sort of that final takeaway um, of just asking yourself these six guiding questions um, and want to leave a couple minutes um, for Q and A, um, I'll I'll share again that I think the catalog has been um, sending emails, but we do office hours from Wednesday eleven to one. Um, if people want to meet one on one and talk through um, uh, ways that that we can create uh, something creative or just brainstorm some ideas that uh, are harder to do just because of time. Uh, really any kind of questions that you have about gamification, game learning, how games might be able to help, um, we're here for, for you all. So any way that we can help, um, that's our, our social media handle at the bottom is Game Genius DC, and I am going to stop talking. Um, so I'll open it up to any questions. Um, I'll probably take bigger, bigger questions, but if they're um, relevant to a, kind of the larger group, uh, that's kind of how I'll frame it and, and say that our Wednesday office hours are, um, are here for kind of that one-to-one -one connection. Yes, I can, I can share that link. Uh, I will do that now. the escape room link. Um, it's the first chapter in a series of four. So we're working on a couple different climate environment uh, storylines, just testing them out and building that awareness. Any other questions, feel free to come off mute if you'd like to come off mute, if you want to ask them verbally or if you want to type them in the chat, I'm open to that too. Yeah, I'm just curious, because um, I know I, I recognize a couple of other organizations that are on this as well. Um, and, and some of us deal with pretty, um, pretty tough subject matter um, that's not usually well paired with um, light activities. <laughs> um, so I just was wondering, and I, I may have missed it, and I apologize, I joined a little late, but, um, you know, how, how might you incorporate some of these things with um, you know, trying to raise, raise awareness or funds for topics that are um, like sexual assault or violence. Yeah, I, yeah. I was gonna say domestic violence or, you know, there's some organizations that I recognize. So thinking about games, not necessarily to, to like, with the goal to make them inherently fun because they're not, um, but more to use some of the dynamics of what games do really well to help think through systems thinking, but also to help build empathy. Um, I think what, what I've found, at least just personally over the last year, is that there's a lot of bad stuff that's in the news. People are getting very bogged down by negative information and how they engage with that is impacting a lot of people's mental health. And so thinking about how you can celebrate what you've done as an organization is a way to, to frame games, right? In the way that's a little bit more natural. So, um, you know, that's where a lot of galas and your, your kind of bigger events start to think about the impact that you've made, um, but also using games to drive a point home on some kind of inequality or um, inefficiency that's happening in your own community. So highlighting uh, the fact that 
a certain demographic isn't getting treated or a certain um, you know, statistic that's really problematic, you can actually build games or little modules around that very statistic and then give people a really clear, simple action step of how they might be able to help and celebrate the ways that individuals can make a difference. Because I think at the end of the day, if you're engaging with some of this content, you're just looking for ways to help. You're looking for ways that you can engage. And if that is too complicated, people generally don't. And that's what games and a lot of the, the data is showing is that give people a, a clear, simple ask, um, don't overcomplicate it to start. And as that relationship grows, they'll be willing to take on more. Um, and so feeling that out, uh, it's, not a, it's not a very specific answer, but hopefully that's helpful in just kind of thinking about maybe a few things that you might be able to focus on around games. Thank you. Do you bring an area or is it just DC or, and uh, I noticed that a lot of your, uh, you know, your services was uh, geared to DC and some, I guess that was Arlington, was that Arlington, Virginia? Yeah. Where you did Arlington? Okay. Is it just the metropolitan area or you, you go Water. A great question. So in my my experience of of working with a lot of, of kind of nonprofit communities is that it's much easier to build trust when you focus hyper local. Um, so as an organization ourselves, we focus primarily on the greater Washington DC area. How we define that is a little bit murky. Like, will we reach up to Baltimore? Maybe, uh, you know, down to Richmond, Virginia, maybe. But we're trying to keep it fairly local around DC just because we feel like those organizations are in an ecosystem, much like the Catalog for Philanthropy kind of has that, that bubble or geographic radius. We're just trying to emphasize collaboration between those groups. So the more we reach out, the less helpful we become because a lot of those connections are um, less relevant, um, especially if you're looking for local funders. Um, okay, so, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? I know we're coming up on the hour and appreciate everyone's time. Hopefully this was uh, somewhat helpful, um, you know, thinking about games as both a, a tool in your tool belt, but also as a, as a system um, and how you might be able to learn and grow from games. I always tell people just play games with other people and watch kind of reactions and how people interact with content because that can be really telling and give you a lot of great ideas for how an event could be better or you can design something brand new. Uh, like I said, I think everyone, everyone who's in a nonprofit is kind of a superhero. So, you know, I know you all have the creative capacity to do it. It's just, um, you know, having the, sometimes the time and uh, energy to, to to launch something new or to try something different.